All right. Well, good morning, Gateway. My name's Steve Harley. I'm the Taze Valley Campus Pastor. Dave is down in Taze Valley this morning, giving our people down there a break from me. So I don't know what that means for you. Uh, <laughs> this video we watched, uh, some, some tough questions that came out of that, huh? So I, I wonder for you all, when was the first time you remember seriously asking that question, why did God let this happen? I know over the years I've asked that many times. One of the most prominent times in my life when I asked that was, uh, was several years back. Um, I first moved to, to West Virginia to Gateway in August of 2004. I can't believe it's going to be 12 years this August. But uh, when I came, I came from a ministry in Ohio, a very good ministry there, great people up there. Uh, but one thing that I was lacking up there was just good, close friendships. And it wasn't the church's fault. Uh, it wasn't anything about them. It was, it was me. Uh, kind of before I'd even gotten into ministry, I'd gotten some advice, and it was horrible advice. The advice was basically, if you're going to be a minister in a church, you shouldn't have close friendships with people in your church because it's going to backfire on you. They're going to betray you. And it must have been from someone who had been scarred by this. And so I kind of took this advice and maybe was a little bit closed off to, to deep, close friendships. So I kind of came to Gateway a little bit lonely uh, from that, lacking some, some intimate friendships. And uh, my very first Sunday at Gateway, uh, Sarah and I, we met a couple, and it was their second Sunday here, Kelly and Lori Holder. Great people. And within weeks, we were in a small group together, and I started starting to make friends with, with Kelly a lot, and we'd start hanging out and talking. And there was something about him that's just, drew it out of me. <laughs> you know, he was very open with me and honest with me and, and connected with me. And so I started developing that, that friendship. He was just so magnetic. You know, people were just drawn to him. And so uh, he was very funny, caring. He, he helped others. He was always serving. One of those guys that just would always make you laugh or just feel comfortable. And, and so that's kind of what draw, drew me to him. And he was probably the first p person that started to draw that out of me where I could develop friendships that now I have and I'm so thankful for. Uh, but he was one of those guys that was just so helpful around the church. You'd see him in the background taking pictures or running sound or helping with electrical things or over at our church camp running electric or something like that. But in early 2006, uh, Kelly got sick. And uh, the doctors at first thought it might be mono, and then it started lasting and lingering for a while. And so uh, he went into Thomas Hospital, and I remember the day he went in there, I went down and visited him, and, um, and he, he said, well, the doctors are, are talking that it, you know, they're testing for some things, but they think it could be leukemia. And, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, no way. You know, and this is Kelly, he's young, he's healthy, and you never think that something like that is going to happen to someone you love. And so uh, that being said, I thought, well, even if it is, even if it is leukemia, this guy is going to kick its butt. He's going to have no problem. He's going to, he's going to kick this thing, and, uh, and we're going to be all right. <laughs> but in April of 2006, Kelly was diagnosed with leukemia. And at the time of diagnosis, he and his wife, Lori, were fostering four children. They, ha they had no children, and they were fostering four children. We're going to adopt all of them. And, uh, but that was all put on hold as his health began to get worse and worse. And eventually... Uh, because of his failing health, they weren't able to adopt those kids, and those kids had to go back into the foster system. Kelly was, uh, went back and forth between hospitals in Charleston and shipped over to Morgantown at Ruby Memorial. And so I'd go to visit him, and he just kept getting worse and worse. And finally, uh, kind of as a last-ditch effort, they, they sent him over to MD Anderson in Houston, Texas for some experimental treatment. And so I flew out to, to Houston to visit my friend in February of 2007 and uh, saw this frail man weighing about 110 pounds. He was originally 165. And uh, he was still Kelly, though, making, making his nurses laugh, making him feel comfortable. Uh, people just loved him and were drawn to him. But he wasn't doing well physically. A month later, Kelly was sent back to Huntington, to the hospice hospital there to spend his final days. And on March 8, 2007, the day before his birthday, Kelly passed away, weighing about 90 pounds. 
and I got angry. Such an incredible young man of God, one of the biggest hearts you could ever find. And I just kept asking God, why did you allow this to happen? Why? Why would you take Kelly when he was doing so much for you? When he was helping so many people, when, when he had these four children they were about to adopt, and now they're back in the foster system? Why would you do that? You leave this young woman as a, now a young widow and so many friends that would miss him so badly. And to this day, I look back and I, I do, I see some good. I see some good that happened through it. I see how he impacted so many lives, but that question of why is still unanswerable to me. After seeing the horrible damage of war, one skeptic scoffed, and I, I sometimes understand why he said this. He said, either God isn't all-powerful, or he just doesn't care. And if you've never had your faith shaken by suffering and tragedy, you're rare. Be thankful. But you will someday. I think even the most dedicated believers wonder at times why God permits so much hurt in this world. So that question that we're tackling today in this series called Room for Doubt is this. Why does God allow tragedy and suffering? Why? Maybe you could put it another way. If God is so good, then why is there evil in this world? And you can look around at this world. <laughs> we have been in an era of unthinkable tragedy, pain, and suffering. Entire villages have been massacred. Women and children have been ripped away from their family, families and sold into slavery. School shootings, suicide bombings, genocide, famines, pandemics, Christians being persecuted and even beheaded. And these are tragedies that are on top of the everyday stuff that you and I face. Maybe some of you are facing it right now, the pain and suffering that we experience in our individual lives. Maybe, maybe illness or injury or abuse, broken relationships, betrayal, sorrow, disappointment, heartache, crime, death. Anyone relate? So God, if you're so good, then why is there so much bad? And why would it happen to such good people like Kelly? That why question goes back, though, thousands and thousands of years. The Old Testament writer of, uh, writers expressed it often. You see it throughout the book of Job. You see it from the writers of the Psalms. And it's been repeated countless times in the 20th century, the bloodiest of all centuries put together. So why all of this? If there's a loving God and a powerful God, why do bad things happen to so many good people? A number of years ago, there was this survey, a national survey that was put out, and they asked people if they had one chance to talk to God and ask him one question, what would they ask him? And the number one response was, why is there suffering in this world? Jesus even warned us in John chapter 16 that you'll have suffering in this world. He didn't say you might suffer. He said you will have suffering, but why? Why, will, why do we have to experience suffering? And if you ask me point blank, why did God allow the, the bombings in Paris? Or the earthquake in Ecuador? Why did God allow Kelly to be taken from this life so early? The only answer that I can honestly give you is a three-word answer. I don't know. I don't know. You may be wondering why I'm preaching this message. I don't know. <laughs> I guess I'm on the schedule. I can't stand in the shoes of God and, and give a complete answer to all of these questions. I don't have God's mind. I'm trying to. I'm trying to develop a mind like his. I don't have God's eyes. I pray that I can develop eyes like that and see the way that he would see, but, uh, but I'm not there. The Bible says, and I never will be, because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, for now we only see a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and that's how I feel. I only know part. But then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So when you ask about specific events and want to know why a particular thing happened, we won't get the full answer in this world. I wish I could give you more, and I'll, I'll give you some other stuff, but someday we're going to see with clarity. But for now, things, things can be a little bit foggy when it comes to 
pain and suffering, and we, can't, we can only understand some. We can't understand everything from our finite perspective. And quite honestly, when you're going through tragedy and suffering and pain, most of the time you don't need big theological answers. You just need comfort. You need the comfort that only Jesus can bring. But it, it helps, especially before we go through this stuff, to get a biblical understanding of suffering to understand some biblical truths that we can lean on when it comes to suffering and tragedies. So again, we're not going to have all the answers when it comes to suffering and tragedy, but I want to, this morning, give you five biblical truths that I think we can lean on when it comes to this. And so the first truth is this. God is not the creator of evil and suffering. God is not the creator of evil and suffering. Now this this, this answers the question we often hear. Why didn't God just create a world where tragedy and suffering didn't exist? And the answer is this. He did. He did. Genesis 1.31 says that God saw all that he had made and it was very good. It was very good. It was perfect. No sin, no suffering, no pain in this world. But if God is not the author of human tragedy or evil or death, then where did it come from? Well, God has always existed from eternity past as, as God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, together in a relationship of perfect love. So, so love is the highest value in this universe, isn't it? And when God decided to create human beings, he wanted us to experience love. But to give us the ability to love, God also had to give us something else. He had to give us the freedom to decide not to love. Why? Because real love always involves a choice. If we were programmed or forced to say, I love you, it wouldn't really be love, would it? You remember those, those dolls? And you could kind of pull the string on the back of them and they would say something, you know? So you pull it and it would say like, I love you. If it, if it said that, does the doll really, you know, love the child who pulled its cord? No, of course not. I mean, if you've seen any of the Chucky movies, you know that all dolls are evil and they hate people. But <laughs> it's programmed. It's programmed to say those words, Right? To experience genuine love, that doll would need the ability to choose to love or choose not to love. Again, real love always involves a choice. So in order for us to experience real love, God gave us this amazing thing we call free will. Unfortunately, we as humans, we've abused this free will. We've rejected God. We've, We've walked away from him. And that's resulted in the introduction of two kinds of evil into this world. Moral evil and natural evil. Now, moral evil is the immorality and the pain and the suffering and tragedy that come because we choose to be selfish, arrogant, uncaring, hateful, and abusive. We we suffer because we sin, and we suffer because other people sin. It hurts us. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So much of the world's suffering results from the sinful actions or inactions of ourselves and others. For example, people look around the world and they they, they see the famine in this world and they wonder, well, where's God in all of this? But in reality, the world produces enough food for each person to have at least 3,000 calories a day. It's our own irresponsibility and our own self-centeredness that prevents people from getting the food that they need. Here's another example. You, You can look at your hand. You can use your hand to hold a gun and shoot someone. Or you can use your hand to to feed hungry people or serve others or help others or be productive. But it's your choice. But it's, it's not, I mean, it's unfair to, to take a gun, shoot someone, kill them, and then blame God for the existence of evil and suffering. It's like that old cartoon said, we have seen the enemy and he is us. Well, the other kind of evil besides moral evil is natural evil. These, this includes things like wildfires and tornadoes, tsunamis, hurricanes, uh, things like that that cause suffering. But if you think about it, these two are an indirect result of sin being allowed into the world. Genesis chapter 3 makes it clear that the curse on creation happened as a result of sin against the Creator. Right? The Bible explains that, that further that it's because of sin that, that nature has been corrupted with thorns and thistles. Weeds, they've entered the world. Romans 8.22 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. In other words, nature longs for redemption to come and for things to be set right. Sin is the, 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 the source 
of disorder and chaos in our world. One author explained it this way. He said, when humans told God to shove off, he partially honored our request. Nature began to revolt. The earth was cursed. Genetic breakdown and disease began. Pain and death became part of the human experience. So let me make this crystal clear once more. God did not create evil and human suffering. Now, it is true that God created the potential for evil to enter this world because that was the only way to cre create the potential for genuine goodness and genuine love. But it was human beings in our own free will who brought out that potential, that potential evil, and brought it into reality. Some people ask, well, couldn't God have foreseen all of this? And no doubt he did. But look at it this way. Many of you are parents and even before you had children, couldn't you foresee that there was a very real possibility that they may suffer disappointment or pain or heartache in life or th that they may turn against you, walk away from you, hurt you? Well, of course. But you still decide to have kids. Why? I, I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know why. <laughs> because you knew that there was also this, this potential, this potential for tremendous joy and deep love and wonderful relationship there. Now that analogy is, is far from perfect. I realize that. But think about God. He undoubtedly knew that we would rebel against him. But he also knew that there would be people who would choose him. Who would choose to follow him and have a relationship with him and spend eternity in heaven with him. He didn't, he didn't pull some cord on us and say, say I love you and force it. We would choose to follow him. And it was all worth it for that even though it would cost his own son great pain, great suffering, and even, even his own death to achieve our redemption. So first, let me help you remember, as we ponder the mystery of pain and evil, God did not create them. Second truth is this. Though suffering is not good, God can use it to accomplish good. Frank Turek, we had him in a, a couple years ago. He wrote this. He said, if, if God prevented pain every time we got into trouble, then we would become the most reckless, self-centered creatures in the universe, and we would never learn from suffering. Instead, listen to one of the most hopeful promises in Scripture. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, leave that up there if you would. Notice that this verse does not say that God causes evil and suffering, just that he promises to cause good to emerge from it. And notice that verse doesn't say that we will all see immediately the good from it, or even, it doesn't even promise that we'll see it in our lifetime, the good that will emerge. But God causes good to emerge from bad circumstances even when we don't see it or don't know it. Remember, we only see things dimly, partially in this world. One day we'll see the whole. Also notice that God does not make this promise to everyone, does he? He makes this, this solemn pledge to others, to, to people who, who are, are, are his followers. So he makes this pledge that bad circumstances may happen, but that good will come from them to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. If you were here about a, a year and a half ago, we did this series called Acts of God, where we studied the life of Joseph in the Old Testament. And maybe even if you weren't here, you know the, the story possibly of Joseph in the Old Testament, how he went through terrible suffering, sold into slavery by his own brothers, falsely accused of a crime and falsely imprisoned for it. And finally, uh, almost 20 years after his brothers had sold him into slavery, Joseph was put into this role of great influence and authority where he could save the lives of so many people, including his family. And so after all of this, Joseph has some perspective on his past now, and he finally meets up, back up with his brothers. And listen to what he says in Genesis 50, verse 20, to his brothers. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. God intended this suffering, this pain, this, this tragedy that I've been through for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives, including his own family. If you're committed to God, this should be very encouraging to you. He promises that he can and will take whatever pain you're experiencing and draw something good from it. 
Remember, God took the very worst thing that has ever happened in the history of this universe. We could call it deicide, or it's the, the death of God on the cross. He took that horrible event and he turned it into the best thing that has happened in history. The opening up of heaven for all who follow him. So if God can take the worst circumstance imaginable and turn it into the very best situation possible, especially for us, can he not take the negative circumstances of your life and create something good from it? He can. And he will. God can use our suffering to draw us to himself, to mold and sharpen our character, to influence others for him. He can draw something good from our pain if we'll trust and follow him. The third truth I want to point out is this. That the day is coming when suffering will cease and God will judge evil. A lot of times you'll hear people say, well, if God has the power to eradicate evil and suffering, then why doesn't he just do it? How come he doesn't just do it? And the answer is that just because he hasn't done it yet doesn't mean he isn't going to do it. It's like reading a novel. If someone only read like half of a, a great novel and then they slammed it down and said, well, pff, the author did a ch terrible job with this book. There are too many loose ends to the plot. The, the, there's no resolve to the issues of these characters. You'd say, you only read half the book. The Bible says that the story of this world isn't over yet. It says that the day will come when sickness and pain will be eradicated and people will be held accountable for the evil that they've committed. Justice will be fully and finally served in a perfect way. And that day will come. But not yet. So what's holding God up then? One answer is that some of you may be delay, delaying God. Some of you. He's actually holding off the consummation of history in anticipation that, that maybe some of you or, or your friends or your family members will still put your trust in him. And as a result, we'll end up spending eternity in heaven with him. Quite possibly, he could be delaying everything out of his love for you and for your friends and for your family. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. To me, that's very compelling evidence of a loving God that he would care that much for you and for those you love to give you just a little bit more time to come to him. But he's not going to wait forever. Don't keep putting him off. It will happen one day. Truth number four is this. Our suffering will pale in comparison to what God has in store for us as his followers. Now, I certainly don't want to minimize your pain or your suffering, but it does help us to kind of take a long-term perspective. If you look at 2 Corinthians 4.17, uh, you need to remember as, as we read it in a second that, that the author is, is the Apostle Paul. And he's suffered through beatings and stonings and shipwreck and imprisonment and rejection and hunger and thirst and homelessness and far more pain than, than, than most of us will ever face in our lifetime. Yet he writes this in 2 Corinthians 4.17. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul says that the sufferings that he faces are, are, are light and momentary troubles. What? From, from a guy who five different times had his back shredded when he was flogged 39 lashes with a whip. From a guy who three times was beaten to a bloody pulp by a rod. Yet he says, our light and more momentary troubles, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. He would also write in Romans 8, 18, he said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. We uh, did a series uh, a while back on Romans chapter 8, and I used this, this illustration that I'm going to use again, but I think it's, it's so fitting to help us understand what Paul is saying here. Let's say on January 1st of this year, of 2016, that you had the worst day ever. Like, you had a, a root canal that day. I don't know why they were open on New Year's Day, but you had a root canal that day, right? And in the middle of the root canal, the anesthesia wears off, and you're facing all this pain. 
You get out of there, you get in your car, you start to drive home, and as you're driving, you, you, you get into an, a car accident, your car is totaled, but you're okay, but you get out to look who hit you, and it's your spouse, and her car's totaled, and she's all right, but two cars totaled right there. You finally get home after getting a rental car and having them towed away, and you go to open your door, and you notice there's a, a letter on the door, taped to the door. It's a foreclosure notice. You're going to be losing your house, and just as you try and get into your house, you get a text from your boss saying, don't come in tomorrow. Your job has been eliminated. Worst day ever. Now imagine on January 2nd, the next day, things start to look up. And I mean way up. On January 2nd, you open the mail and you find that you have a, you'd had a rich uncle you didn't even know about and he had left you $50 million and now you're rolling in the dough like a pastor. Like, just <laughs> stop laughing. <laughs> And so you go out and you buy your dream car. Actually, you buy two of them because you've totaled both of them. Right? You get your dream car. You, you decide you're going to build your dream house. Turns out when you move into your new dream house, you're living right next to LeBron James. He's always asking you to come out and play basketball with him. And you're like, I don't know, Bron, Bron, I don't have time for this today because that's what you call him now. And so... Things are going great. You buy this company and it's doing really well and, and all of a sudden this company that was doing all right before now is, is exploding because they accidentally in their research and development department discovered a cure for cancer. Uh, and so you go and you find this private island and you, it has a yacht and you buy that and, and everything's going pretty well. It's just been an incredible year. Now let's just say on the last day of 2016, one of your friends comes up to you and you haven't seen them in a while and they come up to you and say, Hey, how's your year gone so far for you? You had a good year? And you're like, oh yeah, yeah. You want to come visit me on my private island? Maybe uh, take a trip on my yacht, play some ball with Bron Bron over here? Or, you know, whatever. And, and your friend's like, man, that's so good to hear. Because I, I kind of remember hearing that, you know, you weren't having that great of a year. Something maybe I read on Facebook about you having a root canal and then losing your job and, you know, wrecking cars and losing your house and all this stuff. I don't know. just sound like you were having a bad year. And you think, you're like, oh, yeah. That, that was this year? That, that's, man, that seems like forever ago. I'd forgotten all about that. Yeah, that, that was. That was a, man, that was a rough day. Worst day ever. But I mean, <laughs> compared to the rest of the year, whew, I mean, it's not even worth comparing. That's the perspective that heaven gives us. It's not to say that life is going to be easy. And you might go through 72 years of chronic pain and illness and suffering in this lifetime. It might be very difficult. Worst life ever. But when you're in heaven, and it's been 4,328,222,322 years, and someone comes up to you and says, hey, how's your, uh, how's your existence been so far? You're going to say, man, it's incredible. Heaven is wonderful. I mean, no more pain, no more suffering, no more mourning, no more sickness, no more tears. I'm with God face to face every day. It's been amazing. And they might say, man, that's so great to hear. I, I kind of remember hearing that you were having a pretty uh, terrible existence. I don't know, something about having like this horrible chronic pain for like 72 years. And you think, oh man, that was me? That's right. Yeah, I mean, that, that just seems like forever ago. I mean, I'd forgotten all about that. Yeah, yeah. That was a rough time. I'm not going to deny it. I mean, it was worst life ever. But compared to the rest of my existence, after experiencing heaven, I mean, it's not even worth comparing. That's what Paul is saying. Our present sufferings aren't even worth comparing to the glory that will one day be ours in heaven through Christ Jesus. God promised us a day, a time, when there will be no more crying, no more tears, no more pain and suffering, no more leukemia, when there will be no more death, when we'll be reunited with God in perfect harmony forever. So let's look at truth number five. Fifth truth is this. You always have a choice in suffering. You can turn bitter or you can turn to Jesus. 
And we've all probably seen examples of how the same suffering that causes one person to turn bitter, to reject God, to become hard and to become angry, can cause another person to turn to God, to become more gentle and loving and willing to reach out compassionately to help people who are hurting. So what's the difference? Years ago, I met a man who uh, told me his story. He was talking about um, how his son, who had, who's grown at this time, his son had um, been convicted of a crime and sent to prison. But, but his son had always said he didn't do it, and his, his father believed him. But he was sent to prison, and he spent years there. And, and years later, some more evidence came out that proved that his son was innocent. And so his son was going to be released from prison. Before they could release him, they sent him from this maximum security prison to this minimum security prison to kind of process things, and then he was going to be released, and his, his parents were going to have their, their son back. While he was in the minimum security prison, another inmate murdered this man's son. Innocent man whose life was taken from him. Can you imagine the pain of seeing your own son convicted of a crime that he didn't commit? Finally, when the truth comes out, your son's going to be released. You're going to be united with him again. Your son's life is taken by another prisoner. So this man was telling me this story. He talked about how they went to the court hearing of the man who had murdered their son. And it was a hard time. It's hard to witness all of this. But at the end of the trial, the family was given the opportunity to kind of give a public statement, one that would be recorded in the courts and, and to the media and everything. And instead of expressing bitterness and anger and demanding that this, this murderer's life be taken from him, that, that he get the death penalty, he and his wife instead publicly forgave their son's murderer. This man was a Christian. He went on to share his story with others. And in fact, when I, I heard his story, he was speaking at a youth camp where he was influencing the lives of hundreds of middle school and high school students. And he would go on to continue to meet with his son's murderer in prison and to witness and share the gospel with him. He chose to turn his bitterness into praise. One philosopher said, I believe all suffering is at least potential, potential for good, an opportunity for good. It's up to our free choice to actualize that potential. Not all of us benefit from suffering and learn from it, because that's up to us. It's up to our own free will. We make the choice to either run away from God or to run to him. But let me tell you what happens when we do run to him. Earlier in the message, I mentioned that Jesus said that we will face troubles in this lifetime, that we will face hardships in this life. But let me read the entire verse from John 16, 33. Jesus said, I have told you this, these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In other words, Jesus offers us two, the two very things that we need most when we're hurting. Peace to deal with our present and courage to face our future. How? Because according to this verse, he has conquered the world. Through his own suffering and death, he has deprived the world of its ultimate power over you. And so suffering doesn't have the last word anymore. And death doesn't have the last word anymore. Jesus has the last word. Christian philosopher Peter Kraft explains that God's ultimate answer to suffering is not an explanation. Instead, it's the incarnation. Suffering is a personal problem, and it demands a personal response. And God is not some distant, detached, and disinterested deity. He entered into our world and personally experienced our pain. So Jesus is there in the lowest places of our lives now. So when tragedy strikes, and it will, when you're wrestling with pain, and you will, and when you make the choice to run into his arms, which I hope you do, here's what's, what you're going to discover. You will find peace to deal with your present. You'll find courage to deal with your future. And you'll find the incredible promise that someday you'll have eternal life in heaven with him. One of the best verses you can memorize is 1 John 5.13. John writes, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. There's a very successful 
lawyer in Chicago in the late 1800s by the name of Horatio Spafford. In 1870, Spafford lost his only son to sickness. The following year, the Great Fire of Chicago almost ruined his, his financial investments, the, the wealth that he had built. Two years later, in 1873, he was going to take his wife and four daughters uh, uh, to England for some business, but also for a well-needed vacation. And then he was going to meet up with two of his friends, two evangelist friends of his, Dwight L. Moody and Ira Sankey. Just before boarding uh, the ship to England, Spafford was called away for business. And so uh, he sent his, his wife and four daughters on, on the boat uh, to head over to England, and then he was going to meet up with them later after he took care of some business. So they boarded the SS Ville de Havre, and they set sail for England. But on November 22, 1873, the SS Ville de Havre was struck by another passing vessel, and the ship sank in 12 minutes. Spafford's wife survived, but all four of his girls died in the accident. So his wife cabled a message back to Horatio Spafford with two words, survived alone. Spafford left immediately to head over to, to join his grieving wife. And so while he was on his ship to England to meet up with his wife, the captain of the ship one evening pulled him over late at night, pulled him out onto the deck, put his arm around him and said, we believe this is where uh, the SS uh, Ville de Havre had sank, where your four daughters lost their life. Horatio Spafford was grief-stricken. He eventually went back to his cabin, and in his grief, he pulled out a pen and paper and began to, to pen the words to this familiar hymn. It starts out like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Instead of taking his grief and his sorrow and becoming bitter, Horatio Spafford turned it into praise. The question is, what about you? In your free will, you get to choose. I want to do something a little bit different as I wrap things up this morning. I'm going to ask for a tiny bit of participation, and I know some of you this is going to be uncomfortable. But here's what I'm going to ask. If you have, in the past, dealt with some pain, and suffering and tragedy in your life, and you decided in, in, in that time to not turn bitter, but to turn to Jesus, I'm going to ask that you would stand up just as an encouragement to the rest of us. So if you've gone through some stuff in your life, go ahead and you can stand up. You've gone through some, your, some stuff in your life, and instead of turning bitter, you decide to turn to Jesus if you'd stand up. And I want to thank you for your example and the courage that you displayed in that. And may this be an example for us when we face suffering, that we have tons of people in this room that we can look to and say, they did it too. If they can do it, maybe I can do it. We may be looking at you and going, man, where do you find that peace from? Where do you find that courage? And you can look at us and say, it's only through Jesus. Don't turn bitter, turn to Jesus. Thank you all. Will you sit down for one more opportunity here. Maybe some of you right now are going through some tough times, some hurt, some pain, some tragedy, some loss. I don't know what it is. I'm going to ask, if you're going through that right now and you would like for us to pray for you, I'm just going to pray from here. We're not going to gather around you or anything like that. But if you would stand so that we can pray for you, if you would take the courage to stand and let us pray for you today. And if you're sitting near them, if they'll allow it, if they, they feel uncomfortable with it, don't do it. But if, if you're sitting near and you know them especially, maybe if you could put, put a hand on them as we pray. And I'm going to pray for them if you don't mind. So will you bow with me? Heavenly Father, I want to pray for those who are in here today, especially those who are having the courage to stand right now and admit that right now these things are tough. They're asking for prayer that they don't allow this pain and tragedy to, to make them bitter, but that they would turn to you. So I pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would give them the courage and the boldness to do that. 
that though we can't see all the reasons for this pain and tragedy, it's very unclear maybe right now in their lives, that you would overwhelm them with a sense of peace, knowing that they may not know the future, they may not know the answers why, and they may never know until eternity, but you know. You're not surprised by it. So I pray that they would turn to you in trust and in hope. That they would not run from you in this time of pain and loss and hurt and tragedy and suffering. They would run to you. And that they would experience you in a way that they've never experienced you before. You'd make yourself evident to them that you'd overwhelm them with your peace and give them courage to face the future. That you would take their hand and walk with them. That they could understand that you understand. Maybe no one in this life can understand, but you can understand because you know suffering. You know loss. We have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses because he's been here. He's been through it. We thank you for the suffering that you went through. We thank you that you lived a sinful life, the incredible example that you were to us. But thank you that you just weren't an example, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. That salvation is only found in you, that hope is only found in you, that peace is only found in you. And so those standing today and those who, who were too timid to stand, they're going through it today. May they understand that as well. May they turn to you, give them boldness to turn away from bitterness and to turn to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You guys can sit down. So this morning we want to, uh, as we wrap up today, end with an invitation to you. And the invitation is what we kind of invite you to every week. If you just need some prayer this morning, or maybe you just want to pray on your own, you can come on up here and, and pray, or we'll have people to pray with you. Maybe you're going through it again, and you just want someone to hold your hand and pray over you. We'd love to do that. Maybe today, you've never put your trust in Jesus. <laughs> These things that you're going through, or will go through, or have gone through, don't make a lot of sense, and don't, they aren't easy to go through, and and you've never found peace because you've never put your trust in Jesus. So maybe today is the day that you submit to his lordship, you follow through with committing to him and, and are baptized. Maybe that's your decision today, or maybe it's just a decision to, that you've, you've, you've been searching for a church home, and today you want to put down roots in a church. To make this your church home, if you're an immersed believer, to, to, to be a part of this church as a member, as a partner, to, to join hand in hand as we... We sometimes suffer together and we laugh together and we cry together and we, we love each other and we don't do it perfectly at all. Maybe you can be a part of helping us with that. So if you have a decision to make, I'm going to be up here to your right. Joel will be up here. And um, if you have a decision to make while we sing this song, would you make it? And would you stand as we sing this last song?